Welcome, everyone, and thank you for participating in today's webinar hosted by the National Latina Network for Healthy Families and Communities, a project of Casa Esperanza that builds bridges and connections among research, practice, and policy to advance effective responses, to eliminate domestic violence, and to promote healthy relationships within Latino families and communities. My name is Jose Juan Lara, Jr., team, team member of the National Latina Network, and your host for today's webinar titled Mirando Hacia Atrás, Promotara Wisdom in Hindsight. In this interactive webinar, presenters will draw from their experience, both at the national and community level, to discuss lessons learned from the implementation of the Promotoras model, a widely, a widely used intervention in culturally specific organizations. At the National Latina Network, we have explored this intervention in depth, specifically focusing on their success, effectiveness, and strategies of implementation. What makes this webinar different? Beyond sharing lessons learned, the presenters will discuss strategies they use to overcome challenges, how disputes were handled, if any, and looking back at the Promotora experience. They will explore what's something you know, what's something you know now you wish you had known at the beginning of your work. This webinar will take you behind the scene of the Promotora's work. But before we start, I want to review a few housekeeping details. Please remember to mute yourselves if you are joining by phone or via your computer. If you, are, if, you are, if you are joining us using an agency phone and you have hold music, please be aware that it will be heard if you need to put your call on hold. If you have questions, submit them in the Ask a Question box on the lower right-hand corner of the screen. We will also be providing closed captioning. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the National Latina Network website. Any resources mentioned will be sent to participants after the call, and we'll also receive a survey after exiting the webinar. We kindly ask that you fill it out since this really helps us in shaping the, develop the content of our webinars. I'd also like to invite you to join the National Latina Network for Healthy Families and Communities. Through the network, you will receive updates on public policy, research, and training opportunities. You can join the network by visiting our website at www.nationallatinonetwork.org. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters and work, my work colleagues at the National Latina Network, Cristiana Huitron and Jorge Vidal. Welcome. Cristiana, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, thank you, Jose. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to our webinar, um, Mirando Hacia Atrás, Promotora Wisdom from Hindsight. Um, Jorge, do you want to say hi? Hi. So we're, <laughs> we're using our videos. We're, we're using our videos, but we're going to be pausing in some, por uh, in some portions of the uh, webinar. Um, but at least we wanted to show our faces and just welcome you to this space. Yes, thank you. So um, why this webinar in particular? Um, Jorge lives and, and uh, has worked in, in New York City at, you know, in, as one of the places where he's lived. And I live and work in Colorado as one of the places that I have lived and worked. Um, and we were talking about things that we had in common around doing promotora work in different issues and different applications. And we also, part of that conversation was around doing promotora work in mainstream organizations and in cultural, culturally specific organizations. Um, and one of the common factors in that discussion was the, was looking to Casa de Esperanza, National Latino Network, for guiding documents and um, principles. Um, both of us had had used the tools from Casa de Esperanza. So uh, it became very clear through these conversations that our uh, mission at Casa de Esperanza, at the National Latino Network, very much aligns with the community work that's happening with promotoras around the country, uh, and in a lot of ways has, has opened the path and led the way for us. I will add a couple, just a couple of things, uh, Christiana. You know, we've had this conversation without being called a webinar at least a minimum of three different times. And I think 
the spark for Cristiana and I was that we should make this into a webinar. And we, what we wanted to do in this space or in this conversation is to celebrate as leaders what has worked well, what didn't work well. Um, and then, you know, because a lot of us who have been involved and have been made in community have been doing this work and we don't have time or sometimes we don't take time to pause and like think deeply on our success, what made us successful in this intervention. And then how do we connect with our peers across the U.S.? So um, now being at the national level and giving us access to different organizations, it gives us this opportunity to have this conversation in a larger platform. And so really this is just a celebration that we are doing this work. We have been implementing the Promotoras Leaders work for so many years. So we wanted to make it a little bit different and think about the lessons learned through our journey to celebrate us and what has made it successful in your own community. So it's also seeking from you, your expertise, and your knowledge around um, what made it successful. Absolutely. I think you went through a little bit, right, Cristiana, around um, Casa de Esperanza and, the, and our, our mission or vision to mobilize Latinas to end gender based violence. You mentioned that, and I'll just move forward a little bit around the objectives. Obviously, you know, as, as presenters, as many of you are, we won't read all the, um, the language around the PowerPoint, but again, I just want to reinforce that our intention is really to focus on, this, on, uh, on lessons learned as practitioners, and that means all of us, right? All of us who are in this room, uh, in this space, and as Cristiana and I continue to say, we started as peers. We've moved the ladder in different ways. Sometimes um, we stayed on the side, moving from side to side, and then we ended up at the National Latino Network. So this is just kind of looking back at that. And also seeking your expertise and what have you done, what were some of the challenges, and how did you overcome the challenges? Because a lot of our work as, as national practitioners is also to uh, bring together um, different organizations and different thought leaders around these uh, cultural-specific approaches. So a lot of our work is to also kind of just be the conveners of information um, and discussion, right? And so then the last piece I want to say is that Think of this kind of opportunity as like building a quilt. I don't know, in the HIV kind of world, we build quilts of like memories, right? But also use it as an opportunity to build quilts as expertise and expand the definitions that we bring forward in this uh, webinar. So we may say promotoras is X, Y, and Z from our own lens, from our own perspective, from our own language. But you may have other pieces to that definition that could actually expand the way that we look in the way that um, the promotoras kind of work is. So we kind of welcome that. We, w we welcome this as an opportunity to be a collaborative process of expanding definitions, um, lenses, and also expanding how we interpret um, leaders, leadership programs. With that said, and you're already seeing us, uh, we don't need to put our beautiful pictures uh, on the screen, <laughs> uh, but so, I just want to say a little bit about myself and um, and how I started with CASA. Actually, I was working in New York City with a couple of organizations, um, and I had the opportunity to meet uh, my, my my current supervisor and mentor, um, Heidi Notario, and we just became really good friends and, and obviously collaborated in a lot of initiatives, and that's the way that I entered CASA or became familiar with CASA. Um, and now at CAS, I am the project coordinator, and really my work is to uplift the work of culturally specific organizations through the culture specific service program grant, um, which is the CSSP. So I work with a lot of CSSP grantees. Christiana, you want to tell a little bit about yourself? Yes, definitely. So I live and work in Colorado. I live in Colorado Springs. Um, and I'm, I was born and raised in Colorado, but worked for a short time in Columbus, Nebraska, which is a rural um, community. And that is where I uh, became exposed to promotora work, right? Um, and then it integrated that with domestic violence and sexual assault education. Um, and I came, I'm, I'm here at the National Latino Network on the research and evaluation team. 
uh, working on a, a project specific to meaningful collaborations between mainstream and cultural organizations. So um, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Okay, our next, um, to enter into the conversation with everybody, really we'd like to see, um, there's a poll, um, and we're wondering how many years each of the participants today has been working on or implementing leadership programming. And we're using the term leadership um, around promotora programming. How are you working with people in the community to build their capacity um, to confront social issues? in their own neighborhoods. So you can see how we're defining that. And wondering what everybody brings to the table. We'll give it a couple more seconds. I don't have my stopwatch running. <laughs> Are you doing the happy dance, Cristiana? As we yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> Usually they would play music on a game show, right? <laughs> I know. Next time we will sing, Cristiana, don't you worry. Okay, there you go. Um, so it looks like the majority of people are checking in to see um, how things from promotora work and leadership development could work for them in their areas. Good to know. Boy, do we have a lot to share with you on this topic. So. <laughs> Thank you, Cristiana. Um, and it's also good as, as we do this work, right, and as we're sharing this information to acknowledge the fact that everybody brings expertise. Regardless if you are a zero one, um, you've been hired for a reason and because you have trust and access and knowledge of your community. So it's always bring to, to recognize that and to, um, to show um, how we are also connected as peers. And I keep saying that because sometimes we don't kind of have conversations with other um, other service providers or other community members, and we don't share our great work. So it's always good to have the spaces for that. Um, so a lot of our work that we're going to be talking about is around promotoras, and so we wanted to ground ourselves with certain definitions that we're going to be using uh, throughout the presentation. So it's good, for, it's good to kind of highlight what are those definitions and what do we mean when we say culture-specific organization and when, when we say mainstream organization. At the end, as uh, Jose Juan stated, um, a lot of the PowerPoint is going to be shared. There's going to be a link to documents where definitions are going to be um, shared. You can also download the document, and then you can kind of read more intensively on some of these definitions and how it plays out in your organization. But just to ground ourselves in culture-specific organizations is that organization is predominantly grounded in the from the bottom to from the bottom up on a approach on culture specific realities, right? So when we say that is that we were thinking about the, the physical space. So even like thinking about the environment as you walk into your center. So thinking about the colors, thinking about the the pictures, thinking about all of that. So when mm -hmm. the client comes into your agency all the way to the uh, agency-wide policies and procedures. You are, your whole agency is grounded on culture-specific realities. And when we think about mainstream organizations, is that maybe in the, in the bottom or in the ground, right, um, there are programs for culture-specific population, but as an agency-wide, it's not grounded in um, cultural realities. And how does that show up and what does that look like? So for example, a staff member who is running a culture-specific program is trying to justify or explain why community engagement or building trust with the community is really important. And so when I need to be outside the majority of my time, either going to um, bodegas, going to coffee shops, even having coffee with uh, my community members, I always have to justify and why do I need to do that. When we're constantly justifying and explaining the reasons why is that in the leadership um, level, we are not really grounded in culture-specific realities, right? So 
just to kind of ground ourselves on, on those two distinctions, because that's going to affect the way that we implement, um, the way that we think about strategies, and the way that we're doing the work internally. And then as staff members who are working in mainstream organizations, we're going to have a little conversation towards the end. And what would be some of those negotiation practices when you are working, when you are a culture-specific staff working in a mainstream organization? Does anybody have questions on those two definitions before I move on to the next slide? Christiana? Yes, hello. Um, so along with building on the definitions of culturally specific and mainstream, um, why is it important to distinguish between language and culture? Um, we know that uh, as I'm paraphrasing, but as uh, Freire, Pablo Freire would say that the relationship with the world is the relationship with the word, right? So being able to discuss life experience in the language that one uses to experience life is a really powerful thing. So language has to be taken into consideration, but also life experience, values, language, shape culture which is how one walks in the world. And so um, oftentimes we refer to traditional organizations, um, but I replace that with mainstream. So when I think of traditional, I'm thinking of ways that my grandmother, my abuelita had, or her grandmother, right? That, that there's a tradition that goes, uh, that has roots into something greater or longer than what I know in, in modern times. Um, so as we're looking at language and culture, uh, oftentimes we also have to think about interpreters. This is just a note for practice, that it's not just that they have the language capacity, but also the language specific to our, our, our work, right? Um, and that, yes, interpreters who are certified can be covered under confidentiality, but we also have to assure that they are covered under our confidentiality and that the interpreter errs or invests time on the side of the survivor or the person with whom we're working understanding and that we as uh, professionals would lean towards that. Ideally, we're working in the same language and culture together, um, but we know that la the Latino culture is very wide and varied and that even within Latinos we have different languages and even within Spanish we have different use of uh, different words. So um, it's really important to have discussions around our ethnic culture, our family culture, our organizational culture, and even um, geographic influences on that. So um, these are very important distinctions. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I I realize that uh, we keep mentioning um, promotoras and leaders, so we're going to be interchangeably using those two words, promotoras and leaders, um, during this webinar. And I think, you know, as we are kind of thinking about the distinctions of cultures, of languages, and the demographics, we also understand that that's what makes uh, promotoras really powerful, right? Because they're able to communicate with the community through through their own language, right, that their own country of origin and the, the language that they use on their country of origin. And also they have a cultural awareness of the norms, of how to reach, when to stop, uh, when to move forward, you know. And so sometimes it's really important, especially when we're building trust and access to the community. And then the other piece is that regardless of our differences, you know, um, as, as Christiana mentioned, that we are we are different because region to region, it may look differently, um, population, right? So just because I am Peruvian and I am from Lima, it doesn't mean that all Peruvians are going to look the same, have the same type of culture, the same type of food. Um, so we, we still uh, recognize that we all have a culture-specific organization, that we have similar approach uh, in terms around leadership, we may have a different name. Um, and so we wanted to kind of just put in the next slide is some of the some of the names that have come up through our work and conversations with organizations across um, the US. And so and really just rounding the definition again of promotoras, 
you know, the promotora's work really traced her roots back to Latin America as early as 1950, and it has been really, really effective in the uh, public health arena. And so, because many of you have already have access and have knowledge of the community, we wanted to kind of take a poll and ask, what do you call um, the leaders in your community? So again, you know, the poll is, what do you call the promotoras at your organization? What other names do you use um, for leaders? So if you can just click on one of the bubbles that is on, your, on the screen. Great. So this is really great because we're going to have a conversation a little bit down the road about the distinction um, between the leaders and peer educators and health promoters. Um, and we want to really kind of solidify the distinctions often um, when we hire leaders and when we hire them as peer educators or health promoters. There's a big distinction that um, we're going to be talking a little bit later. But I'm really glad that, you know, that we see that there's different names, obviously. Um, but we know that everybody's doing a, some form of leadership program in their, in their work or agency. So leadership in particular can be looked at in different ways. Um, the, lead, the leadership curriculum that has come out of Casa de Esperanza in particular looks at it as um, internal capacity development. And um, I've seen other models that look at leadership development in uh, learning about how systems work so that systems change can be uh, enacted or, or uh, organized to reach that. So um, there, there are still differences in that, but even the community organization aspect takes internal capacity. Um, almost all curricula that I've been exposed to that deal with leadership with promotoras or community health workers or our volunteers that we're working with in our uh, programs will have some sense of an increase in self-esteem. Um, some of the more successful ones that I, I've seen um, also address some sort of social justice analysis or wasn't only looking at interpersonal relationships, but looking at the social issues from what is called a, a social ecology model, which looks at the individual, the community, um, the family, and the, the society and, and or environment. Um, so uh, we tend to use the term promotora or promotora de salud coming out of the, the public health field, as Jorge said. But the reason that the public health field tapped into that is because they could see that they were not reaching certain um, populations of people based around culture and language. And so people were looking for ways to connect the mainstream organization and their knowledge and mission with people in the in who are being affected by that social issue um, and not necessarily being brought into the, the solution, so to say, as the mainstream organization sees it. I might put that in there also. Um, so regardless of what the mission is and what the curriculum is, leadership is most definitely part of a successful implementation of uh, promotora uh, curriculum or um, work. I want to um, kind of go back a little bit. Go ahead. Sorry, Christian. I just want to go back a little no, bit okay. and kind of because a lot of a lot of you have mentioned that you have um, a minimum of a year to even some of you have ten years. What would you say is the main ingredient from, for promotora's work, based on some of the work that you have done already? If you can just put it in the text box, just a couple of words.
I know some some people are writing, so it takes a little bit while. <laughs> Yes. So, so Cesar Morales, thank you. So uh, you said empowering the Latino community. Yes, so there's a lot of empowerment. And empowerment, you know, I think it's an interesting term because we may define empowerment again, you know, uh, going back to the slide of Christiana, when she was explaining how definition and, and words change um, and change by community and regions and and um, and by demographic areas, I think that we need to also think about what empowerment looks like and how do we define it internally, right? And so, in thinking of also as an evaluation practices, how do we how do we uh, evaluate uh, empowerment in our in our agency? So, thank you for for sharing that, um, Cristiana. You wanted to add something? Um. No, sorry, I was, I was reading these uh, items on the, the screen. Forgive me. Okay. So the other piece, I think, for me, and um, before I go to the next slide, is I think that I, I continually get amazed about how powerful one word is um, and what, you know, that the word promotora or leader is. It could include all of these adjectives, descriptions, ways of being, right? So it's a really powerful word when we say promotoras or leaderes. And when we think about that, we think of all the many things that the promotora has as, as, in, as in their ingredients, right? What is it that they do? Why is it that they're so effective? And I mean, there's plenty of research already that has proven the reasons why they are effective, why we need to integrate like a peer model, a leadership model within the within the organizations. But so these are some of the bucket lists. So some of the things that we said in the previous slide about the trust, about the complication, passion, culturally rooted, you know, we can kind of organize it in different categories. And so, you know, they provide information that are bridge to the communities, right? Especially thinking of marginalized communities who are often left in the margins, who are often not seen, not, not heard, you know, then we want somebody to bring them into the agency. They have influence, they have impact, they have full access to create change, and obviously, as everybody mentioned, they are, they are leaders. So when we look at from Jorge, a larger scale, uh-huh. I'm sorry, can we go back one slide? Um, sure. So to me, in, in this combination of, um, concepts here, it is important to create a distinction between the mainstream application of promotoras or leaders and the culturally specific applications. So for example, with the provide information as a bridge, in a mainstream organization, the promotora takes a lot of weight of the mission right? She becomes the face of the organization in the community and becomes the face of the community in the organization. But if you are implementing promotoras in a culturally specific organization, the uh, distinction and distance between the community and the organization itself becomes much less because usually the, or the community is a, a, an integral part of the organization and vice versa. Does that make sense? Um, so it's one of those things that has to be uh, thought out in implementing, um, and sometimes we don't see those differences until after we've gone through uh, the implementation and uh, can, can compare and contrast things that worked and didn't work um, between culturally specific and mainstream. Thank you, Cristiana. I think that's a really important distinction to make. And and I could also explain it in this way. Um, so in a lot of mainstream organizations, when we think of promotoras, when we think of community leaders, we only see them as on the second side of the bridge, right? So I always joke around, and me and Cristina were, were joking around when we were creating this webinar. Um, it's like they're the Mo Moises, right? Like Moises kind of brings people in and you know, bring me all the Latinos, bring me all of the Asians, bring me all the African Americans, right? So we think of them as just being the bridge, as people who are going to recruit people, who are going to uplift our numbers, and who are going to be 
you know, who are who when the site visits are gonna are gonna happen, um, we met all the numbers, we exceeded all of our numbers. So they only see themselves as a category, as a bridge of um, the community members to the agency. But when we think of leadership, right? We we recognize that they could do all of this. They could they could actually have impact. They could be a bridge. They could actually have or or be uh, transformational in their communities and agencies because they are taking leadership role, meaning like they're leading the way. They are breaking through barriers, um, and they have influence with other people, right? And the way that we allow them to have influence with other people is that we allow them to lead. We allow them, and we recognize that they are also leaders just like us, and may, many of them may not have um, the, you know, the educational background that some, some agencies look for, but they have less experience and knowledge of the community um, that gives them the access and trust. So this is all possible. So if you look at the impact, the bridge, the transformation, leadership, influence, all of this is possible because they have trust, access, and they're available beyond the hours that an agency could actually be available. And that's also really important because, you know, many of us uh, or a lot of us who are social workers in the field or we have some code of ethics, there are places that we cannot go, you know, and there are places that maybe we cannot be invited into their homes. We may not share bread in, in a certain way, right? So we are, we're told this way. But they kind of break those, those, those notions because in reality, in order to build relationships with community members, we have to break that bread. We have to be in places that is outside of the agency. And so even thinking about the school systems and the way that we are trained as social workers, it still is very mainstream. It's very uh, Eurocentric way of looking at, at, um, at social work and looking at the way that we are healers. And so we're kind of reclaiming that notion. And then we're seeing the relationship building at all of its forms at the community level, at the agency level, um, at a larger scale is needed in order to have transformation. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece around leadership is when a leader is grounded in cultural realities, it means that the leader, either it would be a he or a she, understands, for example, that you know starting a, a group for women cannot be possible if we do not have childcare or space for children. So it's simultaneously, right? So when we think about leadership, we think about that we look at a bigger picture. What is it that our community needs? So for example, if our community is dealing a lot with immigration concerns, then I'm gonna kind of pause a little bit on some of those deliverables, and I'm gonna first address the needs of my community in order for them to have conversations around gender-based violence, around HIV, around social uh, justice, around human rights. So that's what a culture-specific leader does, right? It looks at the big picture or what my community needs while still attending to the grant. And so that's really kind of a really important distinction on that, on that piece. Christiana, you want to add anything on this, um, on this chart? Um, I just wanted to highlight, like, as if I actually had a highlighter, you know, going over some text, um, what, what I said about pausing on the deliverables to address the community needs. Um, and I think that that's important enough to to uh, take notes on. That's all. Thank you. Of course. Um, and please, Christiana, just jump in at any time. Because I know I'm 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 in a couple of slides. So another way to also kind of think about this mainstream approach and the culture specific approach is that you know I I will say and I will backtrack a little bit and I will say that regardless if we're mainstream or culture specific, I know based on my conversation um, or anecdotal um, conversations that I've had with organizations is that we are really committed to change. I will not negate that none of the work that we do, there's a commitment to change. But the approach and process on how we want that commitment or how we want that change to be, it looks very differently especially in the way that we integrate promotoras and leaders, right? So we are both committed to change, um, but the way that we integrate them in the work, it looks different. So what I, what I mean by that is that maybe in a cultural, in a mainstream organization, they will have a proposal. So the proposal is to identify there's a grant, and so I'm going to write the grant first, so starting from the grant. So grant becomes number one. Then I'm going to recruit. So recruitment is number two. Then I'm going to ask 
right? So now I have the grant, I have my vision already, I've never included the community. Now I'm gonna ask, hey, we're not getting people, how do we do this? You know, nobody came to our workshop. Now we're, we're kind of brainstorming with the community. After we wrote the grant, after we recruited, we're asking, and then we're implementing. And in, in a culture specific organization, the way that that is flipped is that we're asking first. And I will kind of change a little bit the ask so that we have been always listening with intention. We are listening to the needs, the success, the fears that our community has, and that is gonna drive the way that we see the grants, right? Because then we also, as practitioners, we have to negotiate with funders that their certain initiatives may have to be tweaked in order to meet the needs of, of my community, right? So we're always in that space of listening and asking. So asking for us is like conducting listening sessions, you know, going a little bit deeper. What is it that you want in your future? What is it that makes you happy? How do you feel alive? What is it that you want after, you know, you overcome these challenges, right? So all of that is gonna be part of your of your building of the grant. And then we go through the grant, then we, based on that information, we write the grant, then we recruit and then we implement. And the ask is not one fixed box, but it becomes a, a thing that we do throughout um, the process. So again, it is not a one-time process that we're always listening and asking. It's an ongoing, right? And, and I think that's the difference because in, main, in many mainstream organizations, we see that there's only an ask for listening with intention and one time being. Um, and mm -hmm. that's it, we do the group and then we finish. Okay, that's it, we're done. Okay, it didn't work. The, you know, the implementation didn't work. Okay, we're gonna ask again. So what we say is that we're always asking, we're always listening with intention on that piece. Uh, Christian, well, do you have any questions for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, coming from uh, being an advocate, being a promotora, um, working crisis line, shelters, things like that, and then, um, so coming into the work mainstream, through a mainstream organization, and then uh, embodying the work in my own community and culture, right, um, and now working with the research team, uh, one of the things that I've is a huge takeaway for me from, from being around tech, uh, researchers now is how rich our organizations are with information. So around that asking the community, right? When we're doing our work um, in our own communities, we're surrounded by that information, but sometimes we don't look at it as data that is rich for the mining um, to inform our work. We just look at it as, as the world around us or business as usual or that's just how things are. So we probably already have um, a lot of information, especially in culturally specific organizations, um, that would indicate to us what, uh, what the responses that people want from us, right? So just throw that in there. Great. Thank you so much on that piece. That was really good. So, you know, based on our experience of Christiana has said, and I've kind of talked a little bit about all of us who work at, uh, at the national level and also in Minnesota, and you know, Jose Juan is a prime example of that with all of the experience that he brings into his work, into his training. Um, we, we've created this, this leadership in a collaborative process um, in putting together all of this information, you know, of what we've heard, of the research that we have seen or, or been part of, and we develop a leadership development um, for leaders, and and then Cristiana is going to lead us an evidence-based approach. Um, because you know, I know that in our world, we continually have been asked and pressured to develop evidence-based. So we're now in this lingo of evidence-based, and I know that Cristiana is kind of going to deconstruct the way that we look um, and how we embody evidence-based approaches. Um, but I wanted to just. Uh, pause a little bit um, and take you through just some kind of some side notes on what the leadership development um, curriculum is um, and in the way that you could also implement it in your um, community or in your work um, and then later down uh, the presentation there's going to be ways that you can also ask for the curriculum because it's also available for you to kind of um, modify it uh, and make it your own um, and then, you know, the procedures of that, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so here's what the premise of our curriculum is. Um, 
again, everything that we do, all of the initiatives, all of the documents that we create is is based on the and our mission, right? The, to mobilize Latinas to end violence. So in the, even in the first sentence that we are grounded in communities with and are the only ones to end Lat Latinos, right? It's, it's put in their hands. So it's truly, that's, that's, that's the work that we do in all of our levels, um, from research, from training, from policy level. Um, everything that we do is grounded in that belief. This empowerment that, that uh, someone mentioned um, that is really, really important. And then the other piece is is kind of deconstructing the way that we look at leadership skills. Because I know that many of you have been in contact with community and no communities. Um, and we always have to kind of say that you are also a leader, that you also can do this work. That it's not just, you know, this person who may have a certain degree, who may speak a certain way, who may look a certain way. That you're also, with all of your lived experience, that you could also be a leader. Um, so we are grounded in really in that reality. And then the other piece that I will say is that even though it says a la the Latino community, we constantly speak with lat about Latinos, we know that culture specific in every realm, right? So think about Asian specific, African American specific, even Caribbean specific, right? Even, even in all of those differences that we may have in the surface, we know that underneath, we believe that communities have the power to end um, gender-based violence, right? Because culture-specific approaches are the way to go. And then also because they are rooted in strength-based um, and, and they're really rooted in, in the notion that they could do it once they have the opportunity to, to lead. And then the other piece, again, uh, with this curriculum is that if something happens to the organization, which we know and we trust and believe that the promotoras, leaders, are going to continue with the work. Christian, anything that you want to add around the around this piece? Um, no, I, I this fully shows it for me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and I also want to pause a little bit because you know I feel like we've been talking and I haven't seen a lot of questions, but please feel free again to ask questions. If this resonates with you in any way, please you can also just type yes. You know, and, and the chat box, yes, yes, that means that, you know, the information is resonating. If you have a different definition of leadership, again, or a different way of interpreting or doing the work, please also share with us how you see it, how, as an agency, you have defined it internally, and how you are applying those principles within your organization. So we really, really want to hear from you as well. Um, again, you know, so we already said that from a Latino perspective, um, we also know, again, that all of us who are culturally specific are, re are, are really developing leadership. Although the name may be different, we are all developing leadership. And, you know, as I said previously, it is trans-based, it's developed from bottom to top approach, um, and it's really grounded in the realities of our communities. And then, you know, the piece that I was telling you is that anybody, any, any organization could actually ask for the curriculum and we'll be able to share it. And we provide, Casa de Esperanza provides um, both ongoing support and the implementation and the research level. And that's something that we can talk after the, the training. Um, and then, <clears throat> sorry, in the leadership curriculum, I think one note, one side note to add is that, again, it's a collab collaborative process. And I need to define collaborative process because I think sometimes we say, you know, this grant was written collaborative. And what, when we say, what do you mean by who was in the room? Who, what voices did you hear? Uh, what, you know, what people were you asked to bring in into, into the space to create um, certain tools, a grant? And they will say, well, all the leadership, all of the leadership team attended the, the meeting and everybody gave their invoice and their input and is ready to go. And we say, well, that's great. Um, it's really great that you you involve the leadership um, department, but what about the practitioners? What about the community? What about the people who are actually doing the work? So the community practitioners and the community who are going to be receiving this information, does it resonate? Does it work for them? Is it something that they want to change? So, so again, you know, this curriculum was a collaborative process from our own research team. We have our own research department uh, from community practitioners. So all of us that work at CASA from uh, Minnesota to all the way from Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Texas, 
and all the community members that we have access to, right? So it's, it's a really, truly collaborative process. And when we provide this uh, curriculum to organizations, what we always ask is, how did you modify? What, what changed for you? What didn't resonate for you? So then the other piece around it, and I wanted to really kind of dedicate some time, is thinking about this, this what, what constitutes a leader, because I know that many of us have been in contact with community members who when we ask them, are you a leader, they say, no, I don't think I am a leader, or they're, they don't raise their hands, or they don't want to participate in your leaders uh, program. But I will always say that if you have four or five people in your group or two people that you're already talking, they're already leaders, right? They're already people that could actually be promotoras and leaders with some training, with some um, with some with some type of support. And what's interesting outside of promotoras and the leaders uh, world is that if you just read um, any biographies or stories of great leaders, there's like a commonality, there's a thread that there's someone in their life that actually believes in them, that they saw a potential, that they could actually change the world, their community, their families in one way or another. And that's something that you're going to see in every narrative of a leader. And so when you actually see the potential and you recognize uh, the strength of another individual, what it does, it sparks it ignites this thought of I can't, right? And a lot of us think that we cannot because we have gone through, because we have all of these experiences, because we are struggling with our own identities, our own uh, anti-oppression, right, internal oppression of not being validated through our lives that we don't even have those thoughts. So again, you know, uh, Christiana said, um, you know, this is a social justice kind of work. It's also an anti-oppression work and a human rights oppression uh, work. And I'm just going to move forward because it's 147. And I'm Jorge. kind of taking a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to um, go back to that concept of that somebody believes in the leader and connect yes. that with our work with survivors. So we know that uh, one of the, the uh, ingredients to resiliency is that you have a connection with the healthy adults in your life. So that's resiliency for children, but also for survivors. And oftentimes, people who are adapting promotora work to uh, address domestic violence or sexual assault, um, there's a lot of talk around, like, do we use survivors? Do we not? How does that fit? And we know that being able to see that capacity of being a leader and being able to create a positive action to um, in direct response to the problem are ingredients towards healing. It's not something that we should push people to do, but it's also not something that we should block people to do, right? So mm -hmm. it's one way to, to push towards resilience uh, for survivors. Thank you, Christiana. So mm -hmm. I want to just show you, I want to show you this example from the leadership curriculum. So we kind of walk through with participants, like what is it, who is a leader in these scenarios, right? And for a lot of us who have been in this mindset, who have gone through a lot of trainings, we think of the leader as someone in the bottom, in the, in the front, leading the people um, to a certain way, to a certain way of thinking, to a certain, of acting a certain way. But all of this, so we look at maybe the person in the front uh, and the, and the, from the left, hand side, we could also say that the leader is the person in the, at the end, right? It's probably promoting, supporting the people uh, to not give up. It's giving them aliento, like we say, right? It's giving them support. It says, yes, you can do it. Don't stop. You can do it. So maybe it's like in this scenario, it's more a, a, um, a, a leadership that is combined. It's a combined leadership, right, from, from, the, from both the end and from the bottom. Um, in the ones with the, that looks like um, all the way on the right-hand side, usually we think of a leader as someone who is in the front, right? And so somebody will say, well, the person who is in the front is the leader, right? So I say, you know, we say, well, what about if you're just giving a presentation? Then are you a leader? So again, you know, this is kind of deconstructing again this notion of leadership. And what we really want to do in these conversations and these scenarios is have critical conversations around what constitutes a leadership because a lot of times we in trainings we just give information right and so sometimes with our communities we need to kind of think about where have we inherited this thought of who should be a leader and for a lot of us is because you know we're told that we're not leaders throughout all of our lives 
because of colonization, because of race, um, because of many different many different reasons. So we walk them through this process of what is a leader, who is a leader. I'm going to quickly just go, this is what we look for in characteristics. I know that you could add to this piece and kind of modify it and what exactly you're looking for, but this is what makes us, for us, successful leaders with community members, right? If you're compassionate, if you have language access, you have cultural awareness, and that the, you, that the um, peer or the, prom, or the promotora is really um, grounded in the organization that you work with, right? Very passionate with your vision and mission. So in order to be all of this, right, to be informed, to bring out the best in others, I think what, what a community leader does, it recognizes that everyone inherently possesses a leader quality. And when we think, when we look at somebody and we say, you know, regardless of your experience or what is going on, I'm not just going to look through you in the eyes of a problem, right? Like, oh, I'm, you know, you're seeking help, I'm just going to give you what you need. But I'm going to look at you that beyond that, beyond the situation that you're going through, there's a leader inside of you. And when we make space for that, then we open ourselves to listening, to being present, accepting, um, you know, and we allow ourselves to bring the best in others. I think simply put is that we are very in the receptive mode of, of members of the community. Um, again, this is another community leadership um, definition. Again, you know, please write in the text box anything that, you know, that we missed or anything that you want to expand on community leadership. Uh, so looking at uh, the different curricula that are out there for promotoras um, and in any curricula that we're implementing with people in our organizations and our communities, there's a lot of talk around evidence-based, right? So what does that really mean? Evidence-based means that we've been able to replicate the same curriculum with different people and achieve uh, the same outcomes, basically. Um, but going back to uh, empowering, uh, empowering ways of doing our work and going into um, the culturally specific versus the mainstream aspect of doing things. Uh, one of the things that I love about Casa de Esperanza National Latino Network is that there is this model, right? So um, you'll find at our website that there is actually a building evidence toolkit, which is fantabulous and was built for collaboration with many practitioners and researchers um, and was a labor of love for our research and evaluation team. So um, there's a difference between uh, what we see here, which is, which is the theory of change, okay, and a logic model, two different things. The theory of change uh, is a, 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 like a picture or an explanation of how we think we're going to be creating the change in, um, in the communities that we want to see, okay? Um, can I just get a time check really quick? I just got really confused about where we're at, and if I could just get that. You have about 30 minutes. Okay, you thank you very much. That clarification is helping me. Okay, so um, so with that said, and thank you very much, Jose Juan, um, the, the, the theory of change allows us to plan for how to make the change, um, it allows us to reflect on that. It allows us to reevaluate the achievements along the way. And you can see how the theory of change that CASA has created definitely is based in that intersection of what people in the community are, are bringing to the table, right? Um, and that can be workers in the organization and not be workers in the organization. Um, and then that documented evidence that we talked about, how a lot of the work that we're doing um, is information, it is data, it is, um, sometimes we're not documenting it, but we can document it, right? Um, and then the expertise or the experience, skills, and knowledge that people who are doing the work on, on a daily basis, whether paid or volunteer, such as, you know, promotoras can be paid or volunteer, um, that 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 combination of all of the 
wisdom, skills, and knowledge brings us to the point where we can make a well-educated plan, enact it, and then assess again, which I also very much love about the National Latino Network and the work that happens here is that there is that consistent reflection on the work and then reassessing and adjusting as needed um, rather than rather than the practitioner or the organization saying, I know what works best for you, and if it's not working for you, there must be a problem with you. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that, that advocates out there have heard about difficult clients, right? I'm using air quotes. Um, that really sometimes we just need to adjust what we're doing. And so um, with that said, the Mivetist curriculum in particular is evidence-based, and there are other culturally specific and language, um, ling linguistically appropriate curriculum that are not considered evidence-based in particular, but they are considered promising practice. And the only reason they're missing the evidence-based, well, a reason, is because they, they, uh, they move to respond to the needs of the community, like what Jorge said earlier, right? Pausing the deliverables to respond to the lived needs in the moment. Um, so, uh, so if you have questions about the, the evidence base and how to track that stuff, go to the website. I'm telling you, it's, it's beautiful, and you could get lost in um, the loveliness of that toolkit. Anything to add, Jorge? Uh, no, no, I'm good, Kenna. Thank you. <laughs> so now that we've um, set our our base of the concepts around promotoras and leadership and really kind of dug into some of that, um, we – where am I? Did I go backwards? We wanted to dig into the – accumulation of uh, wisdom and, and share some of those lessons learned, um, but also here, what are some of the lessons learned from the practitioners in, in the community that have, have joined us today? So, So, okay, as we moved into our top 10 lessons learned, um, I guess I'm wondering from participants, are there questions in particular or um, conflicts or problems in particular, challenges in particular that you have run up against or are anticipating? Um, also, one of the things for me, the distinction between mainstream and culturally specific is that uh, the the obstacles can be different sometimes, right? And it's also different if I'm in a decision-making position in my organization and if I'm not. Uh, so there can be internal and external obstacles to to our success in in a the Matara work. Uh. Well, if there's um, no specific questions, Jorge, shall we move into our? Yes, let's do our top 10, Cristiana. I feel like we need those uh, <laughs> drum rolls. I know, it's like the, the big David Letterman moment. <laughs> <laughs> we should have had it like coming in a different size. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to kick it off? Is there something in you, Cristiana, that, you know, as as you've gone through the journey, obviously you and I have been made in community. Have all of our experience come from doing this community work? Is there someone? There's. Is there one that you want to start off instead of going through each list? Um. Well, I think that uh, one of. Oh, sure. Okay. So, uh, resources. Where to begin? That one. That's the one that kind of called out to me right now. In that. Um, when I was introduced to promotora work, I was introduced to it as a promotora, right? And um, 
I wasn't even really familiar with the concept. I just knew what I was doing and how much I loved it, right? Like being in my community with my people and learning and sharing what I was learning. And so um, then moving into developing programs, I the thing that was hard for me was I think sometimes I felt like I had to invent the wheel myself, right? Or figure <laughs> out what the application was going to be and how we were going to do it. And, the reality is, is that at this point in time, we probably have a critical mass of knowledge and expertise in our field and in culturally specific ways, right, um, to, to really help each other build that kind of work and the body of knowledge. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that's why when we started this webinar, you know, we we also recommend the luxury of having conversations, right? Because that's also a privilege for us to kind of sit down and say, what's working? What's not working? What do you have? And I also recognize that many of us who are culture-specific leaders who are running organizations, often you have dual roles or triple roles or you're all of it. You're a finance person. You're a program person. Then you have to go do a fundraiser. And then you have to talk to... Um, you know, you have to talk to uh, uh, funders, and then you're on your weekends, you have families, and then you have other, you're stretched so thin. And so sometimes when we're sitting there and we're creating, developing, we forget that we're also connected. You know, we have a wide range of um, peer support um, that could help you in the process of building and developing instead, instead of starting from scratch. So that's, that to me also, um, I, that, I resonate with that, uh, Cristiana, really deeply. I would also say for me, the tokenize calls my attention a lot, um, just through the trainings and through the conversations that I have with leaders. Um, so Martin Luther King writes a lot in his books around being tokenized. And I really approach, you know, and I really think that for me, it has been an essential reading around this piece. Because when we kind of hire people based on just because they're Latino, they're African American, they're Asian Pacific, we set up unrealistic expectations of how or what the work is going to look like. Um, and what I mean by that and how that affected me as, as a person who worked in different organizations is that, you know, I was looked at as a Latino gay man. So one is that I was going to be bringing Latinos and gay men at the same time. And we know that the gay community looks different if you are in the city, if you are working with white gay men, then Latino gay men, and then within that construction, there's also recent immigrant gay men, and there's also people who are assimilating to the culture. So all of those are, are distinctions, right, within our own communities, subgroups within our communities. So if I was not uh, bringing or bridging people into those, or I was not raising the numbers of my agency, then I will be sitting with my supervisors, right? Hey, what's going on? You're not bringing you're not bringing the gays and the Latinos. What's going on in this in this equation, right? That's why we hire you, without recognizing that our communities look differently and feel differently, right? And so, um, being tokenized just because of your of your race, of your sexual orientation, of your ethnicity creates a lot a lot of problems for community members. But most important, most importantly it creates a problem for the staff member who's been hired on that position. Again, this is a, what I call the Moises effect, right? Moises, like bring all these people into the mm -hmm. agency. Um, and so I think that's something that we have to really be careful at. So to add to that, um, when I was implementing the Promotora uh, model for uh, mainstream organizations across the state, um, there was a, a one one woman in particular. So she had never worked in domestic violence sexual assault field before. Um, we had been recruiting, looking in the community, who, are, who was the leader, right? Who were the leaders to connect with the Latino, immigrant, Spanish-speaking um, population that we were looking to reach to be able to um, implement promotores, right? So we met her. We recruited her. She came to work with us. Uh, and what ended up happening was that Really, her outreach to, to even pull together three women took about a year. Even though she had been the leader and very involved in her community, her own community that fit those demographics, right, um, before she came to the, the, the organization. It, talking about it afterwards, right, so mirando hacia atrás, talking afterwards, what she shared with me was that 
as she moves out of just just helping her community as part of the community and only as part of the community and moved into a formal position of the organization, there were dynamics that shifted. And people, mm. you know, had to build trust with her again. So even though they were her neighbors, her comadres, her friends, and they were still all going to, you know, bautizos and, and bailes together, like, there was this whole new dynamic about, like, why are you over there? And then, um, you know, how can we trust them? How can we trust you? What do you guys need from us, right? Mm. So those unrealistic expectations and, and pulling just one person out as the bridge really does take a lot of adjustment that has to be um, addressed and, and supported, right? Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think that leads us to the other one, too, on that conversation, Christiana, is the, um, the mentoring and critical conversations because everything continues to shift, right? Everything evolves. There's always a changing piece to all of the work that we do, um, even like just the way that the lens, right, the way that we do our work. So sometimes what happens for for a lot of the people who are implementing um, leaders program is that they hire the leaders, they go through a curriculum, a leadership curriculum, and you're all set, you're go. It's like it reminds me of the Mexican kind of ranchera song. It says, solte la rienda, like I'll let you go, and then you do it. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, that the ongoing support is really important um, because, you know, I, gentrification happens in our communities, things happen, um, and so we always need somebody to kind of say, am I doing it correct? This change it. I don't know how to do this, you know. Um, some of them are involved now in research. Like, how do I support you around that? I want to learn around research, and I'm collecting all this inform information. What do I do with it? Um, how, do I, how do I bring that into the agency? So um, a lot of them need that support, and many of them do not receive that in the organization. Mm -hmm. Very true. So I think that connects really well with creativity and incentives and even the silos, right? So mm -hmm. we know that oftentimes when people are new to implementing promotoras work, they don't build into the budget how to support the promotoras in doing the work, right? And mm -hmm. also some people are saying, well, to, to be a volunteer, to be a promotora, you just have to be committed to the mission, right? So that is, that is good and that is true, but the reality is is that there are a lot of paid, air quotes, um, volunteer positions. Crisis lines have been using volunteers for decades and provide a monetary um, offering to cover some of that time. Now, is it enough to, to, to uh, fulfill an employment? It, you know, not necessarily so, but that concept is not new. Um, but we also have to take into account, um, you know, documentation, social security numbers, things like that, that we want to create opportunity for people, not a burden, right? So um, mm -hmm. money is good. How do we hand it to people? Is it, in, is it in a check? Is it in cash? You know, how do we track that? Is it in, um, you know, what, what are some of the incentives you've seen, Jorge, around getting people to, to – uh, to honor people's time that they're they're dedicating. Yeah, I think it's a good question because I think that we're always again, you know, it's always about the asking and listening with intention. And what what do you need if it's not money? Because a lot of them, because of undocumented status, because of you know we didn't put in the budget, we cannot provide a, a large incentive or pay certain staff. But they already know what they want and what they need, right? So if we go with that notion, mm -hmm. um, some of them want training. Some of them want to be part of the organization one way or the other, right? When they see themselves leading and allow them to lead, it gives them this sense of empowerment, right? Now I, I am a leader in this community. So even that is uplifting for them. Uh, involving them in site visits, right? Or involving them in the grant, you know? When uh, I remember we were building a community uh, a community program, and just for them to see the pictures of themselves as community leaders among their community, it just brought such a high respect. They were like sending the pictures back to their family of origin. Look at this, I'm already a promotora, mm -hmm. I've graduated from this. So they even see it as a school, right? Because again, many of them because of the competing needs, because of immigration, because of family, they may not be able to have the time to go to school, traditional school, right, as we describe traditional school but they could attend 
10, 15 trainings, and for them, that's a master's program, right? I've done this leadership program, then I went to this other leadership program, then I got connected to another program, now I have a master's in leadership, right? And so all of them, I think, is a great incentive um, around um, what they need. And I will say, I've, I've traveled with a lot of promotoras. They get so excited when they go to, um, to <laughs> events, right? Even like when they're presenting, right? They get all dressed up and then, you know, um, they're also the party, so, so they put the best dress and they're just having fun. Uh, and I think that's that little break from their, their normalcy of life, right? I think it's also great for them. Um, so incentives to look at a different, different way. So, so for me, that connects with the silos in that um, because promotores have gained popularity recently, um, I used to be able to count how many programs were using promotores in Colorado in the whole state. Now I've lost track, right? And it's being used for anything from um, what they're calling food justice or environmental justice, so gardening in neighborhoods, to um, domestic violence, uh, safety planning, to uh, the, the traditional health promotion, right? But instead of um, competing for promotora time and dedication, because we know that le Leaders who are indigenous to their communities are often uh, easily identified, right? Like if you're connected with the community at all, it is easily identified. So um, for organizations to start thinking about the, the larger community picture also, right? So there are ways to come together with uh, community partners um, to offer a shared curriculum, a shared training, right? So the intersection of oh, immigration rights and domestic violence and sexual assault advocacy, right? So we put together the training for that, and, and as two organizations, we share the time, or, right? So there are creative ways to, to not uh, bring our promotores into the same overworked, isolated ways of doing the work that, that we've done up to this point, right? Um, what do you have to add to that, okay? <laughs> I don't feel like you're amazing, and I just want to acknowledge you on this uh, slide. I love having these conversations with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to the other one. Just we can pick a couple since it's, I'm seeing that it's 2.13, um, and we have a couple more slides to go. Is there anything that here that resonates for you, Christiana, and that you want to kind of uh, – or I could jump in if you want. Go for it. Okay. So for one that uh, really jumps out for me, well, all of them, obviously, right? We picked our top ten. Um, but I think for me, the flexibility uh, is really important on how we implement the way that we construct our program around leadership. We need to have a lot of flexibility. Often, you know, it's not always what it shows from the surface. Sometimes you have to go around to get to meet your goals. So what I mean by that is, like, one of the things that we get is, you know, we don't have 10 leaders. We only have two, three people. Well, that's great. You have three people. That's amazing. That's your beginning, um, that's your beginning kind of, um, uh, what, what would I say, Christina? That's the beginning of how you could start your program, right, with only two, three people. It doesn't have to look like 10 people, 15 people. You know, if they're committed, they're going to bring other people into your group. The other piece is a lot of it, a lot of our peer work now is being connected to grants, and so that means that a lot of it is attached to numbers. So, you know, connect 100 people, do 100 workshops, or do a whatever trainings, right? And then we're like, okay, so how do I do that? I have three leaders, um, and then how am I going to do that work, and I don't have all the participants? I would always say that if you identify three leaders who are passionate, they are committed to your organization, they are grounded to the work that you do, trust and believe that they're going to bring you people into the work that you do because they are invested in you, they're invested in the community, they are invested in the organization. That you may take a little bit, but just give them that space to lead, allow them to come in with the strategies, allow them to welcome their, their creative ideas and how do we reach people and, and move out of the way. Uh, I think that's the most important thing for me as I've learned to, to work with community leaders is that you have to move out of the way and allow them to lead. 
because they're not outreach workers where they just bring you numbers. They have ideas, they have thoughts, they know how to reach their communities, but you have to allow them to lead. So you have to be completely flexible and leave your ego on the side of, like, this is how it should be done. Um, and so I think that's really, really important. I agree with that, um, and I think that I think some of that ties into what Dexter is saying in the the chat box, um, mm-hmm. and so which kind of also goes back to the story about the woman that I was talking about, um, and some of the um, growth, you know, growing pains that that uh, I, that the mainstream organizations experienced uh, with whom I was working with in, in the project here in Colorado is that. When we're making wide and deep change, kind of kind of like gardening, we really have to get the ground ready. We really have to um, tend to what we are growing, right? What we are are nurturing. And so, what I mean is that it's very important to to do that assessment, and not just in the community. We also have to look at our own organization. So. Part of the things that, um, so and the test 10 lessons learned, the framework of policies, procedures, and other services, right? Um, and what is our connection with that, that community already? How do they see us? Like literally, we come to our organization and look at it, you know, take pictures, discuss what that looks like. Uh, we visit other organizations that are already have a good uh, reputation and are, are in the communities we want to reach, right? So I say when we're trying to educate that 100 people, right, that's our goal and objective on the, the grant, like we can't get there if we don't do our work up front. Um, we might be able to, to check off some boxes, but what I've learned about creating change, and I got this from um, a social worker that trained me early on in my work, was that um, no one wants to be the first when it comes to change, but nobody wants to be the last. So it's really about preparing and making sure that your what you have to offer is is 100% and good to go and that you know it and you're ready for it, um, and then bringing in a few key people. And once they're in there with you and solid, the rest will come. Like you'll see the, the, the um, momentum pick up, right? Um, and that is also that transformation versus surface change. Transformation is deep, deep in, right? Um, so yeah, and I would just add to a couple of things. Cesar, um, thank you for writing um, kind of your thoughts around your community. It's great to hear kind of that uh, that perspective. And I, the only thing I will say to that is again, you know, for that uh, for your kind of question, is the flexibility and creativity both at play here? Um, and for me, and I'll, and I'll just show you from, a, from my experience working with uh, in a predominantly Latina-led organization who are primarily the ones who are receiving the information and they have to be the, the, the givers to their family and also bring them to kind of participate. It was really difficult to kind of gauge what would be the best hour, but we played with different hours. So, for example, I supervise the HIV testing program at a at an organization in New York called the Latinas. And a lot of our time frames were from the time of the clubs, right? Or people were going out, or people were coming out of, the, of, um, of, of work. So it would be like 10 o'clock, 11 to like 2 o'clock. But then I realized that a lot of them were actually coming past 2 o'clock. That there were another, another demographic that was also coming in at 3, 4, 5, 6 in the morning. So I implemented a, um, a variety of schedule. So I was playing around with the schedule to see what works best. So I implemented from 8 to 12 on certain dates, uh, and then I tested that out. And then I tested uh, from 1 to 3 o'clock. And then there was one that we actually did from 4 in the morning to 7 o'clock in the, in the morning. And for a lot of agencies, they don't see that as a possibility, right? Because they're like, I'm not going to work from 4 to 7. And the only way that you could do that or you implement that is as you as the leader who is implementing this program, you are also in it. You're also coordinating and doing the outreach with them. Because if you are the leader uh, in your organization, you're saying, I want to implement this program, but you're not there with them doing it, then they're not going to see you, right? They're not going to see this as, as, um, 
as an interest because you're not kind of see, you're not putting it as, as interest um, you're not putting yourself in the front line so I think play around with different times always getting the, the, the right time that works for your community takes some time and it changes all the time you may work for three months so be ready to change it in a couple of months it's always changing it's always kind of moving so it's never the same and then the other piece is if they're mostly females and they're also part of their family obviously it comes as a, as a, as a community um, another thing that I, I did for the um, agency was that we developed a, a health fair, bring your men to get tested or bring your men to receive resources. So it was um, the women bringing in the men. So they would not only bring, you know, in a relationship context, but also like their sons, their nephews, their uncles. So it was bring your men to the doctor um, health fair. So that's another way to like creatively look at how you bring other community members, other families, um, into into your program, you know, and then have conversation nights, dinner nights, you know, you, you've probably done all of that. But again, you know, it's always um, being creative, always moving. So a program has to move every three months because our community is changing because of immigration concerns, jobs, um, they need to go somewhere else. So we're always migrating. So we always think of migration at one time. So I moved from my country of origin here. But we're always moving, either from a different borough to a different city to a different state, and we do that multiple times. I think true, true. we're good. Snap. <laughs> snap, 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 snap. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christina, you want to lead us kind of quickly? I know it's 221 um, to this mainstream piece, and then we can end it. Yes. So, um, all right, so promotores and mainstream organizations. Um, the purpose behind promotoras, right, rather than just the speakers bureau or just volunteers or, you know, just outreach, the purpose of promotoras in particular is for a, a, a culturally and linguistically specific approach. Um, so mainstream organizations may already have some bilingual advocacy. They might already have... Um, some successful programming in uh, cultural communities, but uh, the, the things that will help that to be successful are, are, are a parallel process to what cultural or culturally specific organizations will go through, but there, there's some added aspects to it, right? So, um, for example, uh, how, how does a monolingual English speaker supervise um, the Spanish language aspect of a bilingual uh, position? Now, with that said, we've seen sometimes a person can get hired uh, as a bilingual worker. Other people uh, who were monolingual didn't know their capacity in the, in the second language or in the language not that the person doesn't speak. And um, you know, the programmatic brochure goes out and it doesn't make sense in the language that it was translated to, things like that. We've also seen the opposite side. I've hired a bilingual worker to work in the group with me and I have the bilingual worker interpret every single sentence that has been said in the group and now the entire process has been slowed down, right? So questions that a person has to ask themselves in the organization is, uh, you know, are we ready? What do we have to do to get ready? Uh, how will we implement these things? What are the questions we have to ask ourselves to be able to answer? Um, and why why promotoras as opposed to a speakers bureau? Why promotoras as opposed to uh, partnering with a community partner who's already in the communities that you want to be in? Right. Um, so really deep assessment of why this approach and and not only like the secondary question to me is how does this serve our organization but really like how does it serve the communities that we're trying to get to are there people that are already doing that work and we can shore up their capacity right um so there's a lot of questions to be asking yourself that can lead you to um the way that to, to engage to reach your goals and objectives. And it's not always a promotora program, um, and it might very well be a promotora program. Um, and note to mainstream organizations about cultural humility. 
just in, in knowing that we have a lot to learn, even if we're already doing the work, um, and that it's really about building trust and uh, building a, an organization's reputation in new communities. Um, and I think that sometimes we underestimate how long that can take or how people might already be seeing us. Um, so the, the, the biggest thing for me around uh, notes from mainstream organizations is at minimum, do no harm. Um, uh, to be frank, I have fielded calls uh, from the state level before where people talked about how they, they called in, in Spanish for help, were able to uh, be transferred to a crisis line, but then when it came to next step help, there were not any services there and so um, that, that spoke their language. So. If we create a minimum standard of do no harm, it will really shift the way that we enter into doing our daily work, and it will shift the way that we offer ourselves to connect with survivors. Um, there are we have um, the Fuerza Unida, which will help you with some listening sessions. And we can also provide technical assistance around some assessments. Um, but really, the, the, the main thing is uh, you know, impact versus intentions, right? And uh, being open enough to see from different eyes, right? To hear from mm -hmm. different ears and to uh, be willing to respond to that in meaningful ways that the people who, with whom we're talking to define as meaningful. The only thing I will add to that uh -huh. is that uh, I always think I, I work in three mainstream organizations, and I think that one of the biggest lessons learned was this idea that we often always talk in our communities is a strength in numbers. Um, and I've always found it very useful to find allies within mainstream organizations that could help me kind of have a more buy-in with leadership or buy-in with the, the people who are in, implementing the programs when I am kind of always justifying the need of having this cultural perspective or lens in the work that I do. So always identifying somebody within the organization that you could kind of build some numbers and how do you build your evidence, your proof that this actually works in order for you to be, to, to be allowed to, to create this program through a cultural lens. Another piece I think of it is, is you know, coming from from a standpoint of initiative, right? Like um, just saying, you know, I think some training, I'm noticing there's a trend of in my community or in my outreach that there's a lot of indigenous communities that I'm reaching. And I think as a whole, we, it will be beneficial for us to receive a training around indigenous community and how to outreach with them. So now we're putting it back at the, at the agency, right? So now we're bringing what we've learned from evidence, because some of them want to know evidence and numbers and all that stuff. And I want to kind of institute this agency-wide approach, um, trainings and um, TA. And that's where you can call Casa de Esperanza. And then you can say, you know what, I need some assistance around Latino realities and how do we engage and what, what is the difference between community engagement and what is the difference between outreach. And so we are ready and willing and able to do it. I'm still, I'm, Christian, I'm stealing the slogan from the sanitation department in uh, New York City, ready, willing, and able. Um, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I think we, we can kind of talk a little bit more about those things. And um, just a reminder, on that note, we have about a minute or less. So any last uh, words of wisdom? I think before we got the words of wisdom, thank you for keeping us in check, Jose Juan. I just want to put it out there that if you want to learn more about how to conduct the listening sessions, the leader's curriculum, the evaluation practices that Christiana spoke about, the engagement versus outreach and building this leadership um, within your community, or just bouncing ideas. I think a lot of it, again, is um, saying that you're already doing the work, you're already implementing all of this great, and it's just maybe just bouncing back and forth, like what Christiana and I do. This is the way to reach us, this is the way to contact us, just call us, email us, text us, uh, and we would love to have virtual cafecito with you and just bring some on how we can be of support. And I love this image, Christiana, love it. 
But thank you, everybody, for being part of this conversation, this space. And then we'll definitely send you all, 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 all of the, um, uh, all of the presentations. Sorry. Anything else, Christiana? No. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cesar. <laughs> um, thank you. And yes, we'll check into the certificate. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Cristiana and Jorge. Again, as we mentioned earlier, if you want to receive more information on upcoming webinars or more information on public policy or research that we're doing, please join our listserv at the national Latina network org. Again, thank you, everyone, and have a great